AITA for calling my sister irresponsible and banning her from visiting over plan issue. So, here's the deal. I'm 26, and married to my awesome husband, who's 27. We've got this amazing little girl who's six. Lately, we've been trying to teach her about responsibility. We figured a pet might be too much if something went wrong, so we thought, why not a plant? She was super excited about it, so we went out and got some sweet pea seeds. Our daughter absolutely loved caring for her plant. It was growing like crazy, and she was so into it. We even started calling her Sweet Pea because of how much she adored her little plant. Every day, she'd tell us all about its progress. Then we got some sad news my grandmother passed away. We had to fly out for the funeral, and my sister, who's 22, didn't want to go. She never really knew our grandmother. So I asked her to look after Sweet Pea's plant while we were gone for the week. She agreed, and my daughter even kissed the plant goodbye, asking my sister to take good care of it. My sister assured her she would. When we got back, things took a turn for the worse. My sister had completely forgotten about the plant. She laughed it off saying, oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. She brought out the pot, and the plant was in terrible shape. The stem was snapped, and it was wilted. My daughter ran to the car, crying her eyes out. I was furious and yelled at my sister for being irresponsible. She shrugged it off, saying we could just buy another one, but that wasn't the point. We left, and she hasn't apologized since. Since then, I've cut off contact with her and won't let her visit. My parents are telling me I'm being ridiculous and that it's just a plant, but this isn't the first time my sister has done something like this. She always acts like she's still a teenager and I've let it slide in the past, but this time she really hurt my daughter. My daughter has been so sad since the incident, and she's even asked us to stop calling her Sweet Pea, which breaks my heart. So, Reddit, Ate. I hate seeing my daughter like this, but I don't know if I'm overreacting. Hash hash update. After having some time to cool off and read through the comments, I realized I might have overreacted a bit. I shouldn't have left something so important to my daughter in the hands of my sister. Once my daughter had a bit of time to grieve her plant, we talked about plant life cycles. I told her how proud I was of her for taking such good care of her plant, and that sometimes, even with the best care, plants can die. After our talk, she seemed ready to try again. We went to the garden shop, and she picked out new tools, soil, pots, gloves, and a variety of seeds. She's now really excited about growing vegetables and fruits, too. As for my sister, I tried to explain why the plant meant so much to my daughter and how it couldn't just be replaced. Unfortunately, she didn't understand and lectured me about how it was just a plant, and that they die all the time. My parents also texted me, saying I should let it go. I realized they wouldn't change their minds, so I decided to move on. However, I'll never let my sister handle anything valuable, especially if it's my daughter's. I apologized to my daughter about Sweet Pea, and we hugged it out. We decided to use the old plant as compost for a new one, so in a way, it's still with us. Now, my daughter is happier than ever. She's named all her new plants, as she has twelve now, including two succulents, and she's taking great care of them. She even asked us to call her Sweet Pea again, which brought tears of joy to my eyes. Thank you to everyone who offered suggestions and helped me see things more clearly. We've also found a new potential plant sitter for the future my husband's co-worker, who has a green thumb just like my daughter. We're even considering setting up an indoor sanctuary for the plants when it gets too cold outside. In the end, everything turned out well. Everyone's happy, the plants are already sprouting, and life has never been better. AITA for requiring my friend's partners to contribute to holiday accommodation costs. My friend, M47, and I, F43, had been planning a trip to an island we'd both been dying to visit. We booked a two-bedroom cabin, and because the place is so popular, we had to book and pay ten months in advance. We split the cost 50-50. Two months before our trip, he started dating someone. As the holiday approached, his new girlfriend was understandably uncomfortable with him going on a trip with me alone. I was given an ultimatum, either she comes or the entire holiday is called off. I didn't say yes immediately because I needed to check with the accommodation due to the island's limited guest policy. My hesitation wasn't well received, they thought I wasn't keen on her coming. Within 24 hours, I confirmed with the accommodation that it was okay for her to come and let them know. A week later, my friend informed me that she had her plane tickets. I then asked him if we could discuss rebalancing the accommodation costs now that there were three of us, as it should now be a three-way split. 
To my surprise, he got angry. He argued that since the accommodation was already paid for, it was wrong and greedy of me to expect money from his girlfriend. He said he was paying for her entire holiday, so it was still just him and me paying, and it was unfair of me to ask for a three-way split. I told him that there were three adults now, so it should be split three ways. If he chose to pay for his girlfriend's share, that was his decision and had nothing to do with me. He said his girlfriend was going to buy me a cocktail as a thank you for the accommodation, but if I insisted on a split, I could forget it and buy my own damn cocktails. A cocktail costs $15, and while I was currently covering half of her accommodation costs, which was around $600, and I didn't think I was being unreasonable asking for her slash them to cover her share of the accommodation. I hadn't even met her yet, but they thought I should cover her costs because it was already paid for. AITA for insisting she pay for her component of the cost. Hash hash update. Thank you everyone for your perspectives. It seems there's a split between those who think everyone should pay equally, those who think a couple sharing a bedroom should be treated as one person cost-wise, and those who think the costs should be split considering shared areas. With this in mind and everything else going on, I called the accommodation to discuss options, then called my friend. I explained that our initial agreement was to split everything equally when it was just the two of us, but now that agreement didn't seem fair. I suggested splitting the cost of the communal areas three ways, but setting a cost per bedroom. I also stated that any food activities, etc., wouldn't be split anymore, and we'd each be responsible for our own expenses. They could decide as a couple how they were paying for themselves. This didn't go down well. He didn't see why he should be out of pocket because I decided to go against our agreement. I stuck to my stance and said I'd be willing to negotiate the accommodation costs, but wouldn't pay half for his girlfriend's activities, dinners, and drinks. He called me a B-word and said I was acting crazy. I told him this holiday wasn't going to work, and I'd spoken to the accommodation to cancel. I informed him that if he still wanted to go, the accommodation would hold the booking for 72 hours. If he confirmed, they'd keep $1,800 and from what he contributed and refund me the rest. If they didn't confirm, I'd get the full refund and forward him his share. He went quiet, then told me I should leave the entire accommodation payment because it wasn't his fault I no longer wanted to go, and I was ruining his holiday with his girlfriend. I told him I was canceling and wouldn't pay for accommodation I wasn't using. I might have been a bit petty when I mentioned he'd still be paying for his girlfriend's costs, just more than expected because I wasn't subsidizing them. I canceled my flights and the accommodation, then emailed him all the details. I'd known him for five years as a friend. Yes, I'd had issues with him before regarding his lack of empathy and selfishness, but his personality seemed to change overnight with his new girlfriend. He wasn't willing to discuss options like before. It was his way or no way. This time, I decided to draw the line. I haven't kept in contact with them, but through mutual friends, I found out they tried to find cheaper accommodation on the island, but let the hold expire without confirming. Everything was booked up and they lost the cabin option. I received the full deposit back and immediately transferred his portion to him. A mutual friend told me my ex-friend was pissed off as he had bought non-refundable slash non-transferable plane tickets without travel insurance, losing about $3,200. He felt I ruined his holiday with his girlfriend and owed him an apology and the cost of the fares. That's not going to happen. As for me, I've booked another holiday to the island, staying in a single apartment by myself, and plan to have an awesome time, A-I-T-A, -A, for avoiding my in-laws? I-34F had my first child almost six years ago. Up until my son was born, I had a really nice relationship with my in-laws, and especially my M-I-L. We had been on vacations together, all kinds of stuff. My husband, 35M, is pretty close with his parents and up, until more recently somewhat dependent on them emotionally. My family, on the other hand, is pretty focused on being self-sufficient. I know most people would probably say this about themselves and I have plenty of faults, but I'm pretty laid back and easy to get along with. It takes a lot to ruffle my feathers and I let most stuff just roll off my back. I had my son, who was the first grandchild on either side. I suffered with horrible PPD A. Postpartum depression and anxiety for those who don't know. My in-laws, especially MIL, became extremely present after my son was born. She came to see him at the hospital, and after being there with her sister and my FIL for over five hours I finally asked if they could leave so I could try and get some rest. Things really unraveled during the next nine months. She wanted to be involved in every single thing we did. Part of my PPD was I wanted space from people, so I could use my energy to take care of my son. 
I felt really overwhelmed having her over all of the time as well as my own family. Frankly no one was very helpful they just wanted to be with the baby. I started asking them to leave or visit less. My husband didn't understand why I didn't want people coming over as much. Next came, Maya Mile making comments about how messy our home was. Or being critical about us leaving to put the baby down for naps or bedtime. I get that no one was used to a kid's schedule, so it ruffled feathers with his family. We started, getting in trouble, if we didn't take part in any activity they wanted to do as a family. To the point they would tell my husband's grandfather to stop giving him any money. At this point, the grandfather, actual sweetest man on earth, was giving money here and there to my husband and his sisters if he had extra laying around. His grandfather grew up in Nick extremely poor and was very lucky and worked hard and had a great attitude and was pretty successful. He just wanted people to enjoy it BC he never did. He always had plenty for himself. A few things happen that involve my in-laws talking about me negatively when I'm not around. A friend of my son granted he is still super young but it's still inappropriate. There was one dinner where apparently the one sister and both parents spent the entire meal going after my dad for being cheap and being weird. My dad is just a happy-go-lucky Quaker. Yes, he's a little cheap but he would give the shirt off of his back to anyone and made a lot of effort to get to know my in-laws. I wasn't at this dinner but my husband and his little sister said that it was inappropriate. The parents took the older sister's side and stopped talking to my husband and his little sister and asked the grandfather to give them nothing going forward. My in-laws are the only ones in their families to have had kids so it's sort of always been their show and they are the ones who set the rules. I finally talked to Mill after this BC she had made more comments about bring uncomfortable in my house BC of how messy it was. Yes there was clutter and dishes and laundry but we are by no means absolute slobs. I went to my therapist to practice what to say and how to talk to her. It didn't go well. She was furious my husband had told me the things she had been saying about me behind my back. Denied ever saying anything about my dad. In a last-ditch effort I said, if we can't agree on how I keep the house, or anything else can we least agree that the most important thing here is that my son is loved and cared for. She says. No I can't because I had three kids and never had a problem doing laundry and my house never looked like this. She walked out and told me that our relationship would never be the same, but hopefully at some point we could form a new one. My husband said for the sake of his grandfather who was very elderly by this point and his health was declining still so stuffed with his parents. He was furious for a month or two and then moved on. I continued to hear snide comments and just ignored it. So much more happened but I think I'm spending too much time on this part. It was a control battle for years. If we didn't go to a family event, we would get iced out. It was pretty bad, and I was getting more and more resentful and less willing to deal with it. A few years go by, my grandmother dies and leaves me and my mom a decent amount of money at this point. We buy a bigger house, go on vacation, and becomes apparent to my in-laws that we have more money than we did before they found this very threatening. They would constantly talk about it with my children and present behind my back. On a positive note at this point, my mother-in-law stopped feeling better then and started treating me with more respect because I think she was afraid that we didn't need her even though we actually never needed her. They legit never helped us financially in any capacity. At this point things are getting a little easier because she isn't trying to punish us like children BC, she now sees me on her level I guess. My husband again begs me to be civil and still do things with them so that the grandfather wouldn't get upset. Yes, I realize how fucked up this is. My husband's grandfather basically raised him because his own dad traveled for work 3-4 of the year. Anyways, at this point, I decided I was just gonna keep my head low and play nice until the grandfather passed on, as to not upset him or my husband. The grandfather dies about a year ago. So at this point, I have slowly over the past year, stopped going to any event at my in-law's house. I still take my children over there once a week to hang out, but I drop them off and my husband pick them up. As time has gone on, I am just less willing to spend time with them. Mostly because I am a mom of two young kids and it's a lot of work, and if I can get a few moments to myself while the rest of my family is with my in-laws. I usually take it to my advantage and either take a nap or veg out on the couch. My grandmother died maybe three years ago and since then things have gotten better with my in-laws, I haven't had any major blow-ups with them for probably two years. Some of this is a result of boundaries. I've worked extremely hard to navigate, and some of it is because now that I have some of my own money, they don't disrespect me as much, which is so messed up. 
Here is where I want to know if I'm an asshole. Since there have been no major blow-ups, and they are civil almost every time I'm around them, and this has been going on for close to two years now am I the asshole for saying no more and more to the point where I basically will not engage with them. Even though they haven't been on their worst behavior in two years, I feel like the years of disrespect has gotten me to a point where it doesn't matter how they act now I am unable to have a decent relationship with them because I don't trust them and I don't want to. They're still passive-aggressive and fake and weird to be around. It's not fun for me. I'm an adult to make this choice. I know my husband hears an earful about me not liking them and not going over there from his parents. Which is why he constantly asks me to come. I'm also going to address the relationship I have with my husband around this because I'm sure people are going to ask about it. This has been a sore subject in my relationship since we had kids six years ago. We talked about it at length and ultimately, while my husband supports how I feel and my decisions around this, he does not understand it because of how he was raised. Anyone I know is on my side but it's because it's my family and friends. I wanted to get people's point of view who are not biased. Long story short, my in-laws have not been assholes for the most part in two years. However, I almost always say no to going to their house for no reason other than I don't like them. I am so sorry this is forever long. I'm even more sorry for the horrible run-on sentences, bad grammar, and probably bad spelling halfway through. I decided to use talk to text because it was going too slow at which point everything went to shit. Am I the asshole? A.I.T.A. for avoiding my son when he wanted to spend time with me. I, futa off, love my son Avram 21, but I did not want to be a mom and was denied an abortion. I love him so much, but I never deserved him. I was a terrible mom. I know it was bad untreated depression, but it doesn't excuse anything. His dad and stepmom took him when he was 10, and they loved him so much and made him the most amazing young man in the world. I'm so grateful. After they took him, I got therapy treatment and then spent time in an inpatient for my drinking. Avram wanted to see me, and his dad let me have weekends. I tried to make the best of it and be a good mom this time. He'd always tell me I didn't need to apologize cause I was sick, and he loved living with me. Since he turned up and he spent more time with me, and I know I don't deserve it, and his stepmom does, but I don't do anything cause it makes him happy. This past Friday, his stepmom was hosting a work dinner and wanted all her kids there, but Avram wanted to spend Friday with me cause we always do that. She's more his mom than me, so I knew he should be there for her. But he wouldn't listen and insisted on being with me, so I pretended I wasn't home that day and ghosted him so he'd go, and I saw he did on his girlfriend's IG story. But you can see who sees stories, and she did and messaged me I was selfish for ghosting, and I upset him. She essentially called me an asshole without saying it. He hasn't messaged me much since then either. I don't think I'm wrong. I'm trying to do what's best for him, and that's showing gratitude to the woman who deserves his love. But I thought to try for judgment here. I realized how wrong I was, and I called Avram my son, and thankfully he picked up and came over. The first thing he did before I could even talk was give me a big hug. It almost made me cry, but I held back my tears. I talked to him about his stepmother's event, why he should go, and why I didn't deserve him. I told him about the things that I did when he lived with me as a kid and why I felt I didn't deserve his forgiveness. I guess what shocked me was that Avram pointed out that he didn't see his time with me as bad and that he mostly had happy memories. All the bad times were because I was sick, which wasn't my fault. And it's not things I forgot, I guess, just things that I never valued and I guess never really considered. Small things like how I'd take him shopping at Zulkas on Sundays and always let him buy a toy. How I'd always get a special message printed on his birthday cakes. How I'd always let him sleep hugging me even though he was ten by the time his dad took him. How I'd miss work to stay with him if he got sick. The big thing he told me that made me cry is when he was nine. Kids bullied him when they found out we're ethnically Jewish and made him cry so bad he left school before the Easter egg celebration, so I organized an Easter egg hunt just for him in the park. It wasn't just that, he told me so much more that I did that he valued that if I wrote it here, I think I'd break the word limit. It's so hard to hold on to the happy memories when I think about how terrible I was and how much I yelled at him or drank or smoked, but if he can do it, then I can do it for him. And I've been trying. I've let him control our relationship and I think it's been going well. I've been seeing him much more often, and during Mother's Day, he and his girlfriend took me out to dinner and gave me so many boxes of chocolates. I've only been eating them when they come over so we can have them together. 
Even therapy has been going better since I convinced him to attend some sessions with me, and I think he understands what I went through when I got pregnant and also how much respect I have for his stepmother. Plus, his girlfriend has started going to the gym with me. I love my son so much. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. He is everything that was ever good about me. Thankfully, he has nothing bad with me. Maybe in another world where I didn't end up so damaged, I like to think I would have turned out just like him. He makes me so proud and happy. I will try never to hurt him again and never be so selfish again. So, thank you to everyone who convinced me to apologize, and to all the other mothers out there. Please hug your sons tonight if you can, no matter how old they are. I love my son wholeheartedly. He's a perfect boy and a wonderful young man. He's 23 now, and he's graduated and already got a great job as an accountant, and he went for that career because it's mine. In September, he's going to get married to his fiance. They both honored me this Mother's Day, and it was such a wonderful night at my home, but ever since then, I've had these thoughts that I can't get out. I'm Fudda two years old now, and I feel like my entire life has just been wasted, but that my son is living the best possible version of it. When I got pregnant with my son, I was in a foreign country, and I was swept up in some stupid religious craze with a bunch of other teenagers, and I was pretty much blocked from getting an abortion while I could. At that time, I did not want kids and thought I'd never want them. My life became hell after I had him. I was depressed, I drank, I smoked, I did drugs a few times, and I would spend hours on hours in the gym because I was stupid and thought that I could get my body back and even in the bar because I wanted to be flirted with like before. I had to give up custody of his father and go get inpatient treatment for my drinking, and I've been 10 years sober now. Even though I did all of that horrible, stupid stuff, my son still loves me so much that it doesn't make sense. When I ask him why, he brings up all these good things I can only dimly remember. And it makes me feel so fucking guilty, because if I could go back in time and get an abortion and never have him, I would do it in a heartbeat. He's the best thing that has ever happened to me, and I would do that. And since Mother's Day, I've been thinking. I never got to have the whole college experience like he did because I had him. I never fell in love with somebody who could sweep me off my feet, and I could live out a fairy tale romance with him because I had him. I never got to have a stable and steady career where I eventually ran my own business because of my mental health issues. I never got to decide if I wanted to have kids, or if it was just some teenage fear because I already had one. But he has gotten to do all of that. He's had a great time in university and graduated with distinction. He's been such a good young man because he did sweep his fiance off her feet, and they've told me to expect to be a grandmother soon. I have no friends, I spend my time either at work, home, or the gym, and he's my only real family left, and the only one who loves me, so I shouldn't feel like this. It feels so good to hug him, and he makes me feel so happy and proud, but the moment he's gone back to his father's, I feel sick, and I honestly regret having him because I wish I could have gotten to live his life because I feel like it should have been my life. I told my psychiatrist this during the last session that we had, and we had a good talk, but I can't remember it now, and I don't know why it gets so hard to remember things nowadays. Does any of this make sense? Am I wrong for feeling like this? Featured Comments A cuckrich sucks and sucks at ta. I'm ugly crying at my work desk right now. Good on you for taking advice and talking it out with him. I'm so glad he showed you the mom he sees you as. Look at you from his eyes, mama. I'll give you a saying my father always told me. There is no such thing as a perfect parent. You did the best with the tools you have. And that sounds accurate in your situation as well. Remember, you did the best you could with the tools you had. And obviously you did a great job. Look at how deeply your son loves you. And wants to be around you. If you were half as bad as a mom as you think you were, he wouldn't want to be around you as much as he is. We are our own worst critics. Afak Anutfafa hundred thought a seven. Your son is a wonderful angel, and you are wonderful too. Most parents aren't this self-aware and gracious. You have grown, and you may have had lapses due to illness, but you are a good mother, are a good mother, and you are a good person. Hudspudlud, I'm glad you're working on getting better and developing a better relationship with your son. I'm probably going to get done vetted for this, but situations like yours are why abortion needs to be legal, safe, and easily accessible. While your son turned out fine, there are plenty of kids that go on to have lifelong trauma and mental health problems because they were raised by people that didn't want them in the first place or get thrown into the foster care system fraught with neglect and abuse. I'm sorry you had your right to control what happens to your body and life taken away, op. Nobody deserves to have that happen to them. Ate for banning my daughter's older boyfriend from our home. 
My husband, 46M and I, 48F, have a 20-year-old daughter, Ellie, who is currently on vacation from college. About five months ago, Ellie told us she had a new boyfriend, Tom. This came as a surprise because Ellie hadn't mentioned seeing anyone or that she was dating. But both my husband and I were supportive and happy for her. However, Ellie was strangely secretive about the whole situation. Usually she's an open book, especially with me, and would always share details of her personal life. But this time, she wouldn't show any pictures, and we knew next to nothing about Tom, other than that they met at a party through a mutual friend. Ellie has spent the past month of her vacation in her college town, and the plan was for her to come back this weekend. She asked if she could bring Tom with her for a few days of the trip, as they were getting serious, and she wanted him to meet us. Although we mentioned that we knew barely anything about him, Ellie expressed that it would be a surprise, and that we'd love him. Given he's clearly an important part of our daughter's life, we agreed and said we'd look forward to spending the weekend together. Yesterday morning, we went to pick up Ellie and Tom from the airport to drive them to our place, and we were shocked. We knew instantly that Tom was much older than Ellie and definitely wasn't a college student. I was in a state of surprise, but didn't want to cause a scene, and told my husband to do the same. We drove home, but it was a frosty journey, which Ellie commented on. When we arrived, my husband point-blank asked Tom how old he was. Tom said he was 44. I was immediately disgusted. He's only two years younger than my husband and old enough to be Ellie's father. My husband continued to interrogate him, asking how they met and the whole background. Ellie explained that it was at a party and Tom was there because he's well-known around the town, and they realized they had a lot in common and hit it off from there. I really didn't want to hear any more, and my husband told Tom to leave. Ellie shouted, saying how unfair this was, and we hadn't even given Tom a chance, and that he made her happy. Tom could sense the tension, so he left, and Ellie followed behind him. I texted Ellie to tell her we'd love to see her, and to come over to discuss the situation. She asked if Tom was welcome, and I said he wasn't. Therefore, after labeling me a judgmental asshole, she told me she wasn't coming, and that they would be staying at a local hotel and catching up with friends. I felt terrible about the whole situation, and didn't want to lose my daughter over it. My husband isn't budging, and says he'd have to be held back if he ever saw that man again. Am I the asshole for saying he isn't welcome, or have I done the right thing? Update I was incredibly down throughout most of Sunday, so I spoke to my husband and said that I really wanted to see Ellie. However, I knew that wouldn't be possible without also seeing Tom, so I mentioned to my husband about meeting Ellie and Tom at a neutral location for brunch today. My husband didn't feel in the right frame of mind at this stage, so we agreed that I would go alone. I was anxious throughout the drive, but when I met Ellie, those nerves subsided relatively quickly. I was just happy to see her and that she was well. I still felt a bit uncomfortable around Tom, but I thought this was the opportunity to find out more about him and his intentions. We sat down, and I tried to find out as much information about Tom as possible. When I asked him to elaborate on being known around a college town and being at the same party as Ellie, Tom said he used to go to the same college when he was Ellie's age, loved the place, and decided to never leave. He still frequented the main bars and places that college students do, which meant he remained in the community in some form. I found it quite an unsettling response, but remained polite. In terms of other details, I learned Tom has never been married, nor does he have any children. He works as a software engineer and enjoys cooking and meditation in his spare time. Something felt off about him, but maybe I already had my preconceptions. Ellie spoke more about what a good match they were and how much in common they had. When I asked her to elaborate, she spoke about how they both love the same spots around town and campus, with apparently the same love of sushi, and she's never met someone so mature and understanding. Tom also said that Ellie was perfect for him, and he was serious. I probed if he'd had many other relationships with younger women. Ellie didn't enjoy this question, but Tom said that he generally didn't do relationships, it's something about Ellie had drawn him in. After about two hours, we ended the brunch. Ellie said how nice it had been and she was so happy I had shown an interest in Tom before asking whether they could both come to dinner some evening. I told her that would be nice, but I would have to speak to her dad. Tom shook my hand and that was that. My husband remains reluctant, but I feel it's the right thing to do if we want to maintain a relationship with Ellie. I didn't like Tom off first impressions and this hasn't done much to convince me. Something is just off there, and some of his answers solidified my thoughts about him not being right for Ellie. I suppose I'll have to remain open-minded but appreciate any thoughts. Further update. After I came home from brunch, I spoke to my husband about the possibility of Tom 
and Ellie joining us for dinner one evening. My husband was completely against it, but I told him that if we still wanted to exercise some degree of control over the situation before we pushed Ellie away entirely, this was something we had to agree to. It took a lot of convincing, but my husband agreed, and we invited Tom and Ellie to come round the Saturday just gone. Before then, I ended up talking to my oldest daughter and Ellie's sister, Holly, 23, about the situation. Holly was shocked, and Ellie had told her nothing. Holly decided to do some social media digging but struggled because Tom didn't have much of an online presence. She said she was coming to dinner on Saturday, although I was reluctant because it seemed like it would spiral. I eventually said yes. So we get to dinner on Saturday, and Holly just continually grills Tom. It was far, far worse than I did. She asked him if younger girls were his type, why someone his age is still hanging around at college parties, and other small remarks. Ellie told her multiple times to leave her alone, and I tried to act as a mediator. My husband was just silently seething, and I could tell how uncomfortable he felt in Tom's presence. Eventually, Tom and Ellie said they had some big news to share. Ellie announced that she and Tom were planning to move in together for the upcoming college year. I almost spat my drink out, Ellie had planned to live with other friends, and when I questioned this, Tom answered that he realized that he probably won't have another long-term relationship, Ellie makes him so happy, and he doesn't want to waste any time with who I want to be my wife and the future mother of my children. At this point, my husband lost it and told Tom to get out of his house. Tom stood up affronted, and Ellie started cry. I couldn't remember the last time my husband had shouted like that, and I think it surprised Ellie. Holly said it was deserved and that she needed to get away from the pedo freak. It all ended with Ellie leaving in tears with Tom, my husband going upstairs, and I was just inconsolable. I've reached out to Ellie since but she hasn't responded. I don't want her to move in with Tom, it seems he's trying to derail her whole life. She's 20 and does not need to be married and have kids, especially with someone his age. She's never had a relationship before and she appears infatuated to the extent she's not going to listen. My husband has told me that if Ellie marries Tom, that is it, and he wouldn't want a relationship with her going forward. I can't agree with that and will always love Ellie, but it doesn't mean that the whole situation hasn't made me incredibly sad. I would appreciate any advice. A-I-T-A, for losing my cool with my husband on his family reunion day. I'm a 35-year-old woman married to a 38-year-old man. We've been together for 10 years and have two kids, ages 9 and 5. My husband works incredibly hard, juggling multiple jobs throughout the week. He's buried in debt from his past, which is why he works so much. I also work over 60 hours a week. I handle the household and childcare while most of his income goes toward his debts. I manage everything at home, cleaning, lawn care, repairs, you name it. He helps where he can, but this year, he's taken time off for family and co-worker events and gone on trips with friends. Each time I'm left as the designated babysitter. His parents live nearby, and he spends a lot of time helping them, grocery shopping, fixing things around their house and doing their housework. They do help with his siblings' kids but never ours. His four siblings live close by, but they don't pitch in. I've told him how frustrated I am about being constantly overlooked. Recently, I completely lost it. I found out he'd invited his family over for a reunion last week. I thought he'd taken time off work for it, but he hadn't. The house was a mess, most of it his doing. I had to clean the house, get groceries, run the kids to their weekend events, and start cooking, all while he was still at work. The reunion was set for 4 p.m., right when he gets off. By the time his family started arriving, I was seething. He called asking why there weren't any clean towels for him to use before his shower. That's when I completely lost it in front of his entire family. I ranted about how I'm always put last, how I'm handling everything at home while he works just to pay off his debts, and how I feel like I'm nothing more than an occasional partner when he's in the mood. I told him I was done, packed a bag and drove off. I ended up at a parking lot, hysterical. The kids weren't with me, they were outside playing. He's a good father, but as a husband, I felt like I'd be better off alone. I'm filled with resentment, and his loud and clear text response only added to my anger. It's typical of how he deals with things, avoiding real conversations and emotions. After the text, his family bombarded me with calls and messages. I told my husband I needed space and asked him to stop his family from contacting me. I put my phone on do not disturb except for the kids I pad. I called my mother, sent her some money, and she took the kids for a special overnight at her place. With the kids safe, I FaceTimed them, telling them I was working, even though I wasn't. I used my secret rainy day, fun to book a nice hotel and spa day for myself. 
I spent the day pampering myself, crying, and journaling my feelings. It was something I hadn't had time for in a long while. When I finally checked Reddit, I braced myself for a ton of, you are the asshole comments, but the responses were surprisingly supportive. To clarify a few things, I don't know the full extent of his debts. A lot of it came from his parents putting bills in his name, and some from mismanagement of money and credit cards. After finding a letter saying we were about to lose our house, I took over the finances about three years ago. I supported him through debt repayment, but with inflation and rising costs, it's been overwhelming. I was supposed to go back to school, but had to postpone that to catch up on our finances, hence the 60-plus hour work weeks. I'm a nurse working 12-hour shifts and overtime. I'm exhausted and burnt out, and realizing this now made me see how deeply I've been struggling. His family doesn't babysit our kids because they once did and threw it in our faces. My husband insists he needs to do more for his parents because they won't be around forever, but I think his siblings should share the responsibility too. I've told him that multiple times. When he takes trips, I'm left feeling neglected and angry because I have to beg for time together, and when we do get it, we end up fighting. I'm so full of resentment that it feels almost too late for anything to change. So, I stop, accepted my reality, and had my outburst. I haven't talked to him since besides telling him to call off his family. I'm enjoying the peace and time alone, focusing on myself and my mental health. I need to clear my head before dealing with reality again. Update I'm still upset and disappointed. I have a ton of voicemails from his family, but I can't muster the energy to listen to them all. I called my husband this morning, and he sounded like he hadn't slept. He told me he asked everyone to leave after I left. He was surprised to see my mom picking up the kids. That's when it hit him how serious things were. We had a long talk. I apologized for my outburst and for not communicating better. He admitted that he's glad it happened because his family finally saw how much they've impacted our home life. After I left, he told his siblings they needed to step up and help with their parents. His parents were upset, which I didn't care about. They couldn't believe they were seen as a burden just for asking for a little help. I just rolled my eyes. This time of heart allowed me to express all my feelings, and he admitted he felt like a failure and was ashamed of the debt and the way things have turned out. He said he's been feeling depressed and exhausted because he couldn't see a way out. He'd been going out with friends to escape the stress, which he now realizes wasn't fair to me or the kids. I told him I was sick of his self-pity. I'm depressed too, working myself to the bone, and I'm angry that his income has gone solely to debt with no end in sight. I've been carrying the weight of this marriage and our family, and I feel he's only to blame for that. He said he'd show me everything about his debts and finances and promised he's almost debt-free. He revealed his parents had opened credit cards and bills in his name, racking up nearly $100 in K in debt, ruining his credit. He's been fighting with collection agencies, trying to settle and consolidate debts. He was in tears, saying he didn't know how to tell me the extent of the damage. I was furious. I felt like his mess had ruined my life and our kids' lives. I told him he should have taken action against his parents. He said he didn't call me because he was scared he'd say the wrong thing. I thanked him for his honesty and told him I'm too broken and angry to deal with his issues right now. I need time to clear my head. He suggested marriage counseling and said he'd taken the rest of the week off to work on things. I sobbed uncontrollably asking why he could take time off now but not before. Why didn't I matter before? I told him he needs that time to find counseling and legal advice. I'm not coming home. He begged me to reconsider, worried about the kids and our home. I said I know, this is what needs to be done and had already set things in motion. He hung up on me. I picked up the kids and we're having a fun week at a fancy hotel, swimming room service making memories. I used some of my rainy day fun to extend the stay. Seeing their faces light up when I told them I didn't have to work tonight was priceless. I have a legal consultation tomorrow, and plan to sort things out. A.I.T.A. for saying no to my neighbor? A house across from me recently sold. The previous owners, who built the house and lived there for nearly 50 years, were the sweetest people you could imagine. They're truly missed. I didn't get a chance to meet the new neighbors until recently. They're only living there intermittently while doing renovations, so I haven't had much interaction with them. Our street is quite busy, with a double yellow line down the middle. While street parking isn't illegal, it's definitely dangerous due to the high traffic and narrow road. The new neighbors have a small driveway that can fit maybe six cars, but with their yard set up, there's no room for parking on the lawn. 
I, on the other hand, have a large, circular driveway that could probably accommodate 15 to 20 cars if needed. However, there's only one entrance and exit point to the street, which makes things tricky. The other day, while I was out getting the mail, the new neighbor was outside. She came over, introduced herself, and we had a brief chat. Then she asked, may I ask a favor of you? I laughed and said, well, you can ask. She explained that they were planning a big house party the weekend after the 4th of July, and were expecting a large number of guests. She hoped they could use my driveway for parking since street parking was difficult. I told her sorry no, it would block me in, I'm fine with your guests parking on the grass in front of my fence, there's a small grass strip between my fence and the street, the Smiths, the previous owners, used to do that for large gatherings. She responded, I appreciate that but it'll only fit about six cars, we need space for another 10 to 12 cars beyond what we can fit in our driveway. I reiterated, sorry I really can't offer you use of my driveway, without it being a huge inconvenience for us, I have to say no. She then said, well, my guests could park along the side and back of your driveway, so you can still get in and out. I replied, I'm still gonna have to say no, I'm uncomfortable with your guests on my property, and my only outdoor light is a post light, it gets very dark, and I wouldn't want anyone tripping or getting hurt. She looked frustrated and said, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I don't think they can all park on the street. I suggested, yes, parking is tough around here, there are a couple of municipal buildings nearby. It might be worth calling the town to see if you can use their parking lots since it's the weekend and maybe show people or have them walk, that's about all I can suggest, it's one of the downsides of living on a busy street. I then excused myself and went back inside. Since then, every time I see her, she gives me these dirty looks and doesn't say a word. Honestly, I don't care much about her being unfriendly, we prefer to keep to ourselves anyway. But now I'm wondering, AITA for not letting her use my driveway for her party. Edit just to clarify no, she did not invite me to her party. Second edit a lot of people seem surprised by the large driveways. I live in a former farm town that's now a suburb in the U.S. The houses here are on one to three acre lots, often in the middle of the lot, so long driveways are common. It's nothing special in my area. A.I.T. for not letting my parents know that the event they were skipping was my wedding? I, 27F, have a younger brother, Mike, 21M. He's a man-child and a mama's boy always whining and expecting everyone to cater to him. Ever since he was born, my parents have been doting on him, endlessly. He's not special needs or anything just born, and my parents completely sideline me. My mom, 50F, especially went from being a loving mother to one of those boy moms you see mocked on the internet. My dad, 50M still showed me love and support, but was always too afraid to stand up to my mom. The only one who ever stood up for me was my grandpa, 76M, who always called my parents out and never liked my brother. He says I remind him of his late wife, my grandma, and we share a special bond, but he lives on the other side of the country, so I couldn't see him often. Mike knows our mom, prefers him, and loves to rub it in my face. Because of this and his behavior, we've always been at odds. He's spoiled, a brat, and an awful human. I can't count how many times I got in trouble for things I did better than him or for things he framed me for. His only talent is football, and he won a scholarship to a nice college out of state. My parents didn't spend a dime on my education claiming my fund had been used after a fire, only for me to find out years later that the money was given to Mike to buy a car and a house. In college, I met Lucas. He was the first person I was really drawn to there. Thanks to him and some amazing friends, I managed to move out of my parents' house. Now both Lucas and I are well-known in our fields and have very good salaries. Now to the main issue. Lucas proposed to me a year ago. We are private people, so we didn't post it on social media. When I told my parents, they dismissed it with it, that's nice, I'm starting to think they didn't even listen to me. We wanted a nice but simple ceremony and reception with our friends and relatives. Lucas convinced me to invite my parents and brother, but they never responded to the invite. Whenever I visited and talked about my wedding, without mentioning it was a wedding, my mom would talk over me about my brother's accomplishments. I got fed up and told my mom about an unmovable event I was planning. She said they couldn't attend because my brother had a game that day and wanted them there. This favoritism didn't surprise me, they missed my ballet shows, and both high school and university graduations for things about him. So, I decided to be petty. I told my parents that it wasn't a problem to miss this event, purposely omitting that it was my wedding, and didn't insist further. A few weeks ago, I got married. It was perfect. My family, Lucas' family, and our friends were all there, and we had a blast. My grandpa gave me away, and it was perfect. Relatives kept asking why my parents weren't there, and I honestly said they had my brother's game to attend. 
My grandpa was visibly angry for a while, but otherwise, nothing strange happened. After the reception, Lucas and I went on our honeymoon and were phone-free the whole time. But once we got back, we discovered a shitstorm. I turned my phone on and was bombarded with notifications, mostly from my mother and brother. Mike called me nasty names because one of my aunts posted wedding photos on Facebook, captioned with a dig at my parents for missing the wedding. The post went viral in their community, and they'd been publicly shamed. My grandpa even visited my parents to shame my father, his son, to the point of tears. My father finally rebelled against my mom and is threatening divorce unless she makes it up to me. That's why my mom has been spamming my phone with insulting and then pitiful messages. Now I'm home with my husband, deciding how to handle this. Most of my relatives reached out to apologize for what I went through, but my mom's sisters and friends are belittling me for not telling my mom about the wedding. Personally, I think she's just trying to save face, but I'm not sure. The latest messages from my parents seem extremely saddened and hurt for missing my wedding. Now my family is divided, the majority siding with me, my maternal aunts shaming me for hurting my mom's feelings, and my maternal grandparents insisting I forgive my mom. My best friends are telling me not to listen to them. TLDR, my parents have always preferred my younger brother over me and prioritized his events over mine. I got engaged and told everyone, but they dismissed it. I sent a wedding invitation to my parents and double-checked, but they didn't respond. When I told them the date, they said my brother had a game they had to attend. I didn't repeat that it was my wedding and told them they weren't missing anything. I had my wedding, and now my parents are receiving backlash from my relatives and community after my aunt posted a date at my mother. Edit, thank you so much for the feedback and love. It's overwhelming. I'm going to address the popular questions here. I did inform my parents about my wedding. I sent traditional paper invites to all my guests and was notified that all invites had reached their addresses. I did not receive any answer from my parents and Mike, a few very distant relatives, and some people on Lucas' side. I did reach out to all of them, true message to double check, and those who hadn't replied told me they couldn't come. I asked my parents and brother via text, but they didn't respond. I was left on read. Knowing them and given all the things I had to plan, I didn't bother insisting. I didn't repeat the date of my wedding because I had already been told there was my brother's game. Plus, every time I insisted on highlighting my celebrations to get an answer, I was always told that it wasn't that important and to not be pissy and a bother. Because some things were simply more important than me. At this point I think it's fair for me to not insist anymore. It's not worth the effort. I didn't keep my wedding a secret. I avoided telling my parents that it was my wedding to see if they would be interested in the slightest, but surprise surprise they weren't. Despite this, I did openly talk about my wedding with my aunts and uncles. My mother was in the room with us a few times when I discussed venues or dress shops with my aunt, the FB post one, but sometimes mom was on the phone, and other times she was just chatting with other people. She never paid attention. When I talked about it during reunions, she smiled and said, that's great dear, and then would change the subject. Radio silence on dad and Mike. I kept in contact with them, because all the times I tried to go and see in the past years, I've been harassed. I tried after my high school, bachelor's and master's graduations to which they never bothered to show up for reasons involving my brother. Every time I was shamed for daring to turn my back on family by my parents, my brother, my maternal aunts, and my maternal grandparents. I think the turning point here is that all those times, Lucas wasn't by my side, we started dating a little after my last attempt at going in C, and now that I have him here, I feel more confident in my stance. But before that, I wasn't this confident. As I already stated, all my paternal side lives on the other side of the country, and wasn't aware of how they treated me, I did try to expose my parents once at 14. My aunts, uncles, and grandpa reprimanded them. They faked being sorry, and then once home, I got the beating and gaslighting of my life for lying. After that, I kept in contact regularly with my paternal side, but omitted my parents' abuse out of fear, which still haunts me to this day. Only grandpa knew, but he was always threatened to be alienated from me if he tried anything. My parents and I are not from the same city. I live in a city an hour's drive from my parents' small town, and they don't know my new address because once, my brother tried to break into my apartment to steal some cash, and my mother backed him up, claiming that siblings share their goods. Now I'm moved, and I'll be sure not to tell them where I live. My parents didn't buy my brother a car and a house before he even started high school. They bought him a car for his 16th birthday, and a house near his college when he began freshman year. They didn't spend the money from my fund right away, they just lied to me to use it later for my brother keeping it stored for later in the meantime. To those who believe my story was fake, I want to say that I'm happy your family life is better than mine, 
to the point of thinking of my reality as a fantasy, but I'd appreciate it if you stopped harassing me in DM, claiming that I'm writing a fake story for attention. You are not forced to read my story, or think it's true, but I think keeping the smallest amount of decency would be nice. Oh, and before diving into the update, let me clarify a few things. Yes, the invitation specifically stated it was a wedding. No excuses. My maternal side of the family didn't come to the wedding. Most of my relatives are my dad's siblings and cousins who didn't cut ties with me when I tried to expose my parents for their abuse. I haven't invited any aunts or cousins on my mother's side, because they've always been nasty and have a tendency to gossip. My grandpa is my dad's father. Update. I've been meaning to update you all for a while now, but everything has been crazy, and we had to sort things out first. Thank you so much for the love and support. Lucas and I read through your comments, and felt blessed for the encouragement and suggestions. A week after my post, we contacted our attorney to see if there was a way to keep our address hidden from my parents, in case they started harassing me. Luckily, given that we live in a private, gated complex, we're safe from unexpected guests. I reached out to my paternal aunts and uncles and explained the situation. They were disgusted but happy I confided in them. They offered to house us for a while if things escalated. Some even offered to help us if we ever moved closer to them. I felt truly grateful for having them in my life. I decided to go and see with my parents for good. Luca's family fully supports me, and they even invited me to spend Christmas with them. We agreed, but before we left, we had a long discussion about our future and boundaries. Lucas is my rock, and I'm so thankful for his support. My grandpa called me multiple times to make sure I was okay. He offered to help with legal fees if needed, and even suggested I get a restraining order if my parents kept harassing me. I'm considering it but haven't taken steps yet. Now, about my parents. My dad contacted me first, apologizing for everything and admitting he had been a coward. He promised he was divorcing my mom and wanted to rebuild our relationship. I told him I needed time and would consider it after the divorce was finalized. He seemed genuinely remorseful and agreed to my terms. My mom, on the other hand, was relentless. She kept sending messages, alternating between insults and pleas for forgiveness. I blocked her on all platforms. Then she showed up at my workplace, causing a scene. Security escorted her out, and I filed a report. My HR was understanding and supportive, assuring me they'd take action if she returned. Mike surprisingly stayed quiet after his initial outburst. I think my grandpa gave him a stern talking to her. He's still living off my parents and hasn't contacted me since. As for the viral Facebook post, my aunt refused to take it down despite my mom's demands. It seems the post garnered support from other relatives who weren't aware of my parents' behavior. It's been shared multiple times and my mom's reputation has taken a serious hit in their community. She's facing backlash from her friends and distant relatives. We're still dealing with the aftermath, but I feel lighter. Cutting off toxic people, even family, has been liberating. Lucas and I are focusing on our future and the wonderful family we're building together. Thank you Reddit for the support and advice. It's been a tough journey, but I'm hopeful for better days ahead. AITA for refusing to be a stay-at-home wife after I retire. I'm retiring in about three and a half months, January 2024, and my husband and I disagree on how the division of labor should be once that happens. Since meeting my now husband, I've been very vocal about my plans to retire when I turn 40. I've planned my life around this goal, lived below my means ever since college, and gave up things to meet this goal. We got married in our early 30s, so it's only been seven years since then. He also saves for retirement, I finally got him to up his amount to 20%, but won't be able to retire until at least 62. He's instead chosen to spend his money on things that make him happy, and I fully support and encourage him in, that, everyone has different goals in life. We are both child-free by choice, so that isn't a factor here. I've said in the past that I'm not going to be doing all of the cooking, cleaning and finances once I retire because I don't want to replace one job with another. I currently do all the cooking, most of the finances, and probably 25% of the cleaning. I think that it's fair as my husband usually works more hours than I do, and I'm a picky eater, so it just works out the best. He recently made a casual comment about how he's going to start working more overtime once I retire because he'll have less household stuff to do. I asked him what he meant by that since my retirement doesn't really change anything for him, and that I preferred he didn't work more overtime so we could spend time together. He said that most husbands with stay-at-home wives don't clean the house. I didn't know what to say because I thought we had already discussed this, so I tried my best to change the subject, but we had an argument about it yesterday at dinner, and he's now giving me the silent treatment. I slept in the guest room last night as he locked our bedroom door and wouldn't let me in. I just don't know how to get through to him. 
even though I'll no longer be working, I won't be a stay-at-home wife, by my own definition. To me, a stay-at-home partner is the manager of the home and doesn't bring in much, if any, income. Their job is to take care of the home. I'm not trading one job for another, I'm retiring. I'm still bringing in income, I've just planned my life so I no longer have to work 9 to 5 to do so. I have multiple hobbies that I have been super excited about devoting more time to. I love rock hounding, crocheting and hiking. I'm an unpublished writer, and have always dreamed of becoming published. I have a lifestyle blog, and a pretty active Pinterest following, I'm not super consistent, and they're not big enough to monetize, so I count them as hobbies, not side jobs. I also have a very long travel bucket list. I've already started looking into non-profits in my area where I could volunteer. I know I still have limited hours in a day, but even if I only volunteer one day a week, I still feel like I could be helping our local community. I know we've had conversations about this and he's always been supportive, even of me leaving for a few weeks every so often to solo travel, he's always been excited for me, I'm totally confused about this change, and I'm freaking out. I thought I communicated my expectations, but he's saying that he doesn't ever remember talking about it, and that he's not okay with me retiring if I'm just going to be lazy. I don't see it that way, am I wrong? So he came home very late that night after ignoring his phone. We didn't end up talking about it, so I slept in the guest room again. He works from home on Tuesday and Thursday, so the next day he was home when I got off of work. I spent the day gathering my thoughts and preparing to have a calm discussion. I tried to remain calm, but he was so defensive and accusatory that I was getting very frustrated. We weren't very productive, and we ended our talk with him denying that I would pay 70% of the expenses, even though we had planned this out and budgeted together based on it. I told him I'd go through our expenses to prove it. And being the person that I am, I did so the next day. This is where the problem starts. When I was going through our expenses, I found a charge on my husband's credit card from two weeks ago that I did not recognize. It was not an insignificant amount, so I originally looked into it just to see if it was a household or personal expense to use in my calculations. It turned out to be a bill paid to a law office. For very obvious reasons, I wanted to know more about why he was being billed by a law office. I looked up the office, and it was a divorce attorney specializing in property division. I logged into his email, I have proof that he has given me permission to access his email at any time to go over expenses and expenses-related issues, and found his conversations with said lawyer. He was trying to find a way to overturn our prenup, so he gets half instead of what is agreed upon in our prenup, and wanted to try and get alimony as well. I had no idea he wasn't happy until we started arguing on Saturday. That morning he woke me up with breakfast in bed, a total surprise since it wasn't a special day and he almost never cooks. Two weeks ago, we had a Star Wars movie marathon and ran around the house in a lightsaber battle. Last month, he communicated that he felt like we weren't spending as much time together as we normally do, so I plan more date nights. He's gotten me flowers at least once a week for months now. I just didn't understand why he wanted to divorce without even trying to express what he was feeling to me first. When I went all the way back to the very first emails, late July, a woman we'll call Ashley was brought up. I tried to think of a way to confirm my suspicions without him suspecting that I knew what he'd been up to. On Saturdays we sometimes get takeout, so I purposely left my phone upstairs and asked him if I could use his to order the food. I was taking too long to figure out what I wanted, so he went downstairs to finish what he was doing, giving me more time. It was hard to wait that long without letting on what I knew, but from Thursday to Saturday, I began to get a plan in place. I spoke with a divorce attorney, scheduled my consultation, and made sure I had any legal and financial documents I may need. On Saturday, when I went through his phone, I found Instagram messages between him and Ashley. By going through the messages and looking at her account, I figure out a lot about her. Ashley seems to be a nice girl he met on Tinder back in May. She is 27 and married to her high school sweetheart, who can't bring in enough income for her to be a stay-at-home wife. Considering my husband works in tech, and by looking at the messages, lied about how much he makes, he is obviously the better option. He's lied to her about wanting to have kids and has told her that it's the reason he is unhappy in our marriage. I don't know what he's thinking she's going to do when she finds out he had a vasectomy. Ashley is apparently willing to be a proper woman and do wifely duties, these are her words, not my husband's. From cross-checking dates when he's supposed to be hanging out with friends or at a work thing, he's actually with her. She has a weird work schedule, so she sometimes comes over to her house on the days he works from home and I'm in the office. She is convinced that after they both go through their respective divorces, they'll live in the house together, get married, and have kids. He has just gone along with everything she says. He's told her that I'm lazy and hardly make any money, and I wanted to quit my job and not do any work, which is why he's finally gotten the courage to leave me. He said that he's taking extra care in the divorce because he doesn't want to leave me with nothing. He also told her I changed my mind about having kids, and that I was denying him his masculine desire to continue his lineage. Now, you may be thinking, are you stupid? How did you not know? The answer is I had no idea, and I must have been dumb as he had played me for a fool. 
I'm trying to put some humor in this for my own sake, but I'm sobbing as I write this. I just got back from my new attorney's office with a lot of forms to fill out, and I'm so overwhelmed and still feel confused for some reason. This must just be a really bad dream. I reached out to Ashley's husband, and they're probably heading towards divorce as well. He seems like a nice enough guy, but he's also totally blindsided by the affair. I told my husband I was divorcing him last night and told me could I just sleep in one of the guest rooms or get a hotel room. He chose the latter. So, that's my update. Our prenup has a 99% chance of holding up in court, but we also have an infidelity clause that I'm hoping to prove so I can keep 100% of the house. I was willing to put my dream house in the infidelity clause because I knew I would never cheat. He was fine with it at the time as well, but is now blowing up my phone about it. If I can't prove his affair, which is unlikely considering the evidence I have, I would have to pay him about 25% of our equity in the house. Which is enough for a down payment on another house, so he wants me to not bring his affair into our divorce. Which is weird to me, since he had no qualms with bringing the affair into our marriage. Fake names to make things easier. My ex, Derek. X is AP, Ashley. A piece X, Jake. Going back to the earliest piece of drama, most of what I'm recounting is from Jake's perspective, as I was not directly involved in this story. I blocked Derek and communicated through my lawyer, nothing crazy happened when he had to come to the house. In October, Derek had a meeting with his lawyer. We're guessing his lawyer had some bad news for him, or maybe finally told him that he was screwed. Whatever it was, it caused him to have a mental breakdown, where he basically confessed everything to Ashley, and told her that he was going to lose everything. It took her another day to show up at Jake's house, apologizing and wanting to make things work. He didn't take her up on that, and at this point they are also divorced. She claimed that Derek manipulated her, but they are now back together, so I guess she hasn't had enough yet. I don't know if she knows about the vasectomy as I haven't had contact with her, Jake hasn't told her, and she didn't say anything about that to Jake when she ran back to him. She could know, but I don't know one way or another. That's her problem now. And by that, I mean the whole man. Derek cried in court multiple times and screamed at his lawyer once. He genuinely didn't look okay, and I do hope he figures things out for himself. Our prenup held up, and nothing was deemed unconscionable. I came out with a house, my car, and all of my separate property. I had to pay him a small lamb, some alimony payment. Stupid things he tried to argue, he should get at least half of because they weren't in our prenup. My rock collection, Ak and my baby. He knew this would hurt me the most. He didn't get any of it. My fine china sets. They were painted by my great-grandmother and given to me by my grandma. I don't know why he thought the judge would side with him. My car. I literally paid for both of our cars, and he tried to get half the value of mine and keep his. Make it make sense. Multiple vintage furniture pieces that I flipped myself, and he had no interest in until now. He got a few of them, plus a bunch of other stuff, so a furniture run is in order. Some other fun details. I had a divorce-slash-retirement party at my house after everything was finalized. All mutual friends stopped being friends with him after I told him what happened. He still has other friends, and they don't seem to care about the situation, so who knows what he told them. His mom and I are still friends, she came to the party. I'm relieved that the divorce process has come to an end, and I can now look forward to a fresh start. I want to express my gratitude for the support and understanding you've all shown me during this challenging time. If anyone has any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them.